Hello, good afternoon um, to our guest lecture here. A guest lecture with uh, Patricia Albers on the financial markets. Uh, we're going to talk about um, technical analysis of the financial markets. Uh, very appropriate title about market clouds of what's going to happen here. Uh, Patricia has been uh, a guest speaker and a guest at Regents University repeatedly over the last few years. We know her well. She is an, uh, a, um, I call her a market guru, a technical analysis chartist guru. She doesn't like the title. She calls it, I think, probably more like an expert. She's been, uh, even though she's very young, she's been in the markets for many, many years. Uh, she teaches with other universities like ESSP and others. And, um, and, and we know her well and we like her because of her uh, sharp mind, of her insight. She uh, gives regular updates on the markets uh, on um, channels such as uh, IG Index, they have a TV channel and others. Um, so without any further ado, I would like to pass on to Patricia, who's going to talk about uh, probably 20 to 30 minutes about the markets, about what has happened in the last few weeks and with some uh, perhaps probably uh, complemented with some general observations about technical analysis, about what it is and how it works. And then later I will uh, give you the opportunity to ask questions. So over to you, Patricia. It's all yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jacob. That's lovely. And um, I'm delighted to be here. Now, as Jacob said, which is interesting, is the last guest lecture that I did was roughly a year ago. It was in February 2019. And what I thought would be interesting, as we know, a lot has happened, especially in the last month. So what I thought would be interesting is actually to look at some past charts and to look at it from the last lecture and see from then on what's happened. So shortly, I'll be looking at the um, PowerPoint presentation with you, and we'll look at that together. Now, before I start, there's something interesting. We, I attended a fascinating um, wealth management forum, which was organized by Regents, um, uh, which Jacob invited me to, and it was on the 21st of November, 2019. And the title was, um, it was the fourth annual Wealth Management Forum, and it was on the depression, the different economic depression that we've seen. And having a chat um, to Jacob earlier on, we talked about what's the difference, what we're seeing at the moment, which we don't know, we, do, we still don't know what to call it. There's still all these different names. We still don't know what kind of crisis we're in. And the interesting thing that we do know is the response has been very different. So the one thing which Jacob mentioned, which I think is really, really relevant, is that in the previous ones, what we've seen is maybe a very slow response. This time, the speed at which governments have come in has been phenomenal. And to that extent, the big difference is would that be sufficient for it not to drag on and for it to be a different types of shape. So we can talk about that more at a later stage. Okay, so we're gonna start with the PowerPoint presentation and I always like to make my presentations interactive, which is not as easy when it's not face to face, but I would definitely ask you at any stage just to type anything on the chat and I can address it. Or if there are certain questions that I want to ask you, I might ask you just to type them on the chat. So it just becomes more interactive rather than just me. So let's start with our presentation. I'm just going to share the screen to call it up. So everybody can see that correctly. Uh, I'm just going to make... Oops. 
Is that shared, Jacob? Is that fine? Yeah, it's fine. Oh, you can see. Th thank you. Yeah, you very good. You can see it. Okay. So the first one is the just the main lecture. You see that, yeah? Yes. Okay. So I can start with. I just want to make sure everyone can see. You can see the chart properly and everything, yeah? Yes, very good. Lovely. Okay, so as I said earlier on, the last lecture was in February 2019. So at the time, we we're talking about what are the trend lines. Whenever we talk about, I tend to look mostly at tech analysis, how the charts are moving, what are the patterns, what are the trends, you know, what, are, what is the direction? So if I look at this, which is the S&P 500, we had this very long-term trend line, which we can identify here. So we've got this very long-term trend line. And at the time on the S&P 500, just short of 3,000, we had a double top formation, which was worrying. But I remember at the presentation saying, it is worrying, but beware because we have got a long-term trend line support holding. So what happened since then, as we all know, let's have a look at the next chart here. So what happened since then, we actually went down. Market made new highs just short of 3,500. And then the strong move that we've seen, the huge sell-off broke through the trend line. And since then, a very sharp recovery. It's not just a bounce, it's actually a very sharp bounce in a very short time. So when we look at that, the first thing we say is how much of recovery have we seen? So the down move was something like, we saw something like 30%, over 30% down move, 34%. Since then, we've seen a recovery which is above the 50% retracement. What do we mean? If we look at the top and we look at the lows that we've seen over this month, 50% <clears throat> gives you the indication of how much the recovery is. And whenever it's above 50%, it usually tells us that there is a chance that the market is gonna stabilize rather than go all the way back down. So in this case, our 50% level is 28.08. And today we're trading at 28.78. So these are all quite significant levels, apart from everything else that's happening, apart from all the economic activity, all the news, which obviously has to be incorporated. We also focus on the important levels. So at the moment, in our heads, we know that we're above 50% of that retracement. And the big level for us is 3,000, which is psychological level. So these are the levels which we have to keep aware of if we're thinking maybe there is going to be more of a recovery from there. We are near levels which are quite significant. Moving on to exactly the same kind of pattern and this is with the Dow Jones Industrial Average. This is what we had in February 2019. And we saw very similar, when I spoke to you about the S&P, it was just below 3,000. And if we look at the Dow Jones here, we've got, again, a very topish pattern. And when I did the presentation then, we mentioned that it bounced off but it hasn't actually broken through the highs. So let's see at, let's have a look at the chart from then. So that was the February and we're still above the long-term trend line. And this is the current situation. So again, we made historic highs um, and then the sharp down move that we're seeing. Now, in terms of the recovery in the Dow, we've seen a move, the big move there, which we always look about in terms of psychological level, is 25,000. So at the moment, we're around 24,450. 
Now, if we talk about the 50% retracement, as we did in the S&P, that level comes in at 24,000. So in both cases, in, in the S&P, we've broken through the 50%. In the Dow, 24,000 is going to be our pivotal level. So this is always interesting to have both in your mind. What's happening? What do we think about the economic factors? What do we think about that? And then what do we think about the technical levels? So right now, we're very close to psychological levels, 24,000 and then 25,000 being the level in terms of your resistance. So just to have a little bit on the um, technical analysis, there's, there's so many different things related to charting. And I think in your course, if you're interested in doing more, there's a lot of research you can do and there's a lot you can read. But I think it's good to know uh, what's behind it. And then you can actually, at the end, I've put a few books to recommend. You can look at that and say, well, this is something I'm really interested in. Or actually, this is nonsense. I'm not interested in it at all. But in any case, it's good to have that knowledge. So one of the first things that we look at is Dow theory and goes back as far back as 1882. And when we look at um, the trends, we always think about the trends as the major, the secondary, and then the minor. And in terms of the major trend, it's also compared to the tide of the sea. So it's the tide of the sea, it's the biggest move, it's something which goes on for over a year. So that would be your primary, your major trend. Then Dow spoke about the secondary trend or intermediate, and that refer, refers more to the waves in the sea. And it's usually three weeks, three months. And then the minor trend, which is like the ripples, is something which is very short term, less than three weeks. It could even be hourly. You could be looking at just very, very short term if you're an FX trader and you need to know what's happening between um, the Europe open and the Europe close, you wouldn't be interested in the primary and the intermediate. You'll just be interested in tick by tick and you'd be probably looking more at the minor trend. So within those trends, you have the three phases. And I think once you identify those three phases, you're able to use that on any market. And I think it's something which um, you know, you can focus on and you can identify them on the market which you're studying. So let's start with the three phases. The first one is accumulation. This is when you've actually got informed buying. So all the news has been discounted in the, by the market and you have a good reason to want to buy a particular um, stock or a particular currency. So it's accumulation phase. The second phase is when it's increased buying. So accumulation is starting to, to buy, but increase is more of an impulsive move. And often it's quicker to come in on the increased buying because you've got more of a confirmation. So most cautious people who are cautious would be coming on the second phase. And then the third phase, the distribution phase, is probably one of the hardest one to identify because it's the top of a move. So it's when it's going up, but it's fading. The actual interest is starting to, even though people are still talking about it, it's the end of the move. And it's when it's time to distribute when no one else seems to be selling that you're on top of it. And often with the distribution phase, I always think it's a bit like the herd when everyone's doing something and it becomes so widespread that you think, okay, I'm going against it because there's too much on there. There's too much news, too much has come out. And when I look at the FT, for example, and I see a major story on companies and markets, which has been moved to the front page of the FT, I always think, are we on the distribution phase? Because it's becoming too much of a topical news, which really belongs to the financial the companies and market space is coming on the main page. Have we heard too much about it? So do we become a contrarian and go against the move? So that's the distribution phase. So to, to a lot of, you know, to a certain degree, you can apply this to most markets. And obviously 
if you can identify the phase and it's the correct phase, then that's the biggest success. And it's not, as, as we all know, it's not always easy to identify the specific phase. So when we spoke earlier on about the long-term chart, and I mentioned um, big levels, psychological levels, what do we mean? So what we mean is um, there's always a level on the downside which can be really hard to break. So it's like a floor, it's like a support level. And often if there's a level and you're bouncing off that level, you need to know how much of a support it's going to be. So if we're looking at euro dollar at the moment, 105 is a good psychological support level. In sterling, 120, often a round number, is a strong psychological level. So these are all psychological support. On the upside, when we talk about resistance, is how hard it is to break through a top. And it's like a ceiling. So at the moment, even though sterling's gone up towards 125, 124, 80, our psychological level is 130. <clears throat> and I'm going to show you at the end um, a very key level in sterling as well from a very long term trend line. And in terms of dollar yen, 110. So all these levels are important because once you break through these levels, it's like you're used to these numbers and people get used to them and there could be a trigger to go higher or lower. Very important to always keep in mind what are those levels. So if we move on to um, just looking at this, for example, if I look at the Hang Seng index here, and I'd say to you here, for example, um, if I'd say to you, this is the Hang Seng index, what would you say, and let's say we're trading at 23,831, let's say around 24,000. So if I'd say, what's the next psychological resistance level? I just want a few of you just to type on the chat what you think it would be. So we're trading around 24,000. What do you see as the next psychological level on the upside. Okay. So just to get your ideas, it doesn't have to be exactly, exactly, just to have your ideas about next psychological resistance. So, okay, we'll do one in a little bit. Okay. You saw the chat from uh, Arba. He thinks the market to go up from here, right? He hasn't. You yeah. want a level? You want a specific level? Yes, just an idea of the psychological resistance. Let's say we're at 24,000. Oh, 18,000. Okay, so the psychological, so what I'm asking you is on the upside, what would you think on the upside is the round level? Yeah, that's a support, correct. So what on the, on the upside, what's the round level which you think is important in terms of excellent? Kiko, you've got it, 25,000. So initially, 25,000 is going to be on our mind as this is our psychological level. Once we break through 25,000, if we look at the chart here, we can see, can you see a gap which happened when we had that strong down move? So once 25,000 has been broken, we're looking to see, are we able to fill that gap? And then from there, the big levels are going to be 30,000. So even though it's quite far away, it's just an indication of what are the important levels in the market. 
obviously there's so much behind it and obviously we you know the time frame we don't know how how long it's going to take to to get to those levels is it ever going to reach there you know soon but we need to know what those levels are lovely so in terms of in terms of the charts we've looked at i've looked at mostly bar charts um, which gives you the open high low close now, when you're looking at any markets, you have a choice of what to use. And thankfully, most systems, Bloomberg, Reuters, any of the systems um, that you use would give you a choice of charts. And of course, you become more familiar and you decide which ones to use. It's important for you to be aware of all of them. First one, the line charts, useful, but although it's clear and you can see one price, it doesn't give us enough information. We want to know what the open was. We don't just want to know one price, the closing. I want to know what the open, high, the low, the close. So that's why we could use the bar chart. Within the bar chart, we can compare days, if a day is a reversal day. Now, the third type of chart is the point and figure chart, dates back to the 1900s, but it's not as popular today. Um, used to be extremely popular and it's using the X and naught for going up and down. And finally, the candlestick chart is something which was developed by Japanese rice traders in the 1700s. And I would say today is probably the most widely used chart. The reason being that it's very, very easy to read. And it's like, it's got like a pop-up. You can look at it and straight away you can see is the market up or down because of the shape of and the color of the candle. So what do we mean by candlestick charts? All it means is that you're looking at the formation of the difference between the open and the close. So if the open is here and your close is here, you have got a bullish candle because you're closing above. So you've got a bullish candle. And then that's called the body. So it's just the terminology is called the body. The high and the low for the day or the week is called the upper and the lower shadow. So once you know how to construct a candle, you can look for information within that. So you can look for a bullish candle if the open is above the close a bearish candle if the open is here but you've actually gone all the way down and you've closed lower so you've got a bearish candle now what happens when you have the open and the close at the same level something like that you have something called a doji pattern so the candle doesn't have a body it just has a cross which is the open and the close at the same level so very interesting to look at different candles. And the, the reason why they're so popular, as I say, is they're very easy to read. You've got this pop-up figure. And also what you can do is compare candles. So if I look at this chart of the Euro dollar and the 20 day moving average, if you look at the peak here, the most recent peak, just under 110. So we had a white candle here followed by a bearish candle. So the fact that the candle covered the other one is called a bearish engulfing pattern. So you have a white candle bullish and then you have a bigger one bearish candle and that would be a bearish signal. So you've got a reversal which was shown just below 110. If you have actually a white candle, really kind of bullish candle, and the next candle covers half of it, this is what you call a dark cloud cover. It means that you had a bullish day, suddenly you've got a dark cloud over it. So again, it's a reversal. So it's interesting when you look at the charts to look at, are there any good candle formation that would give me an edge and would let me know that, okay, maybe there is a pause, it's a bearish candle, it's a reversal. So we look at all these things um, together with support resistance chart formation. So another chart that we looked at in 
February 2019 was sterling dollar. And it's always good a year later today, where are we in comparison? So the first thing I want you to look at is the trend line. So as we said in Dow theory, we start off by the primary trend. So if we look at the trend line here and I say to you straight away, what's the primary trend? You're able to say it's down because if you look at the trend line from as far back as 2007 or before, you've got a very long term trend line resistance and we're trading still below that trend line resistance. So very long term trend is still down. We're still below that. And then we can look at the support. And if I was to say, what's your major support here? We can see quite clearly 120 as a lot of basing pattern. And as I showed you there, there's like a support across. Now, since then, let's have a look at what's happened. So the next chart here, which tells us March now, what's happened since then is that first thing we can see straight away is our long-term trend line is still holding quite strongly. So we can see that. Um, in terms of support, we mentioned 120 was quite significant. Over the big sell-off, Sterling had a huge sell-off, a huge down move and broke through 120. So we went as far as just above 114. So that was 114.10 around there. So we had a huge sell-off. Now, how different are the charts? We've, we've had a bounce since then. But if I was to look at it today and say, okay, we're trading at 124.70, 120 today is still our strong psychological support. Even though we went all the way down to 114.5, 120 today is quite significant. In terms of the long-term picture, the next level is 130 in terms of our key level. And then the big level for the longer term, if we ever saw a sharp sterling turnaround, would have to be the break of the over 10 years, 13 year trend line, which comes in at 138. So these are all really interesting in terms of trying to see which levels, which levels will give us an indication of, if, you know, is it just a correction or is it a big turnaround? So in terms of sterling 130 and 138 are huge levels in terms of the longer term trend. In terms of support, 120 is at the moment our base and the risk was 114.50, which it, which it touched on, but now 120 is the base that we're talking about. So when you're doing any kind of um, trading, when you're looking at different types of charts, whether it's equities, whether it's um, you know, some of the FX pairs or some of the commodities, I think in your mind, or everyone has some kind of um, a plan. And I've put in together this plan, which a lot of people use, but in different, uh, to a certain degree, you would stick to it to another degree. You would think I haven't got time to look at all these. So you would just look at two or three main points from the plan. But in any case, it would be a very similar pattern. You're starting by choosing the chart you want to use. You might just look at candlesticks. And then you look at the trend and we all do that. Whatever you're looking at, you start from the long term and you bring it down to the short term. And then you look at it within my chart. Are there any continuation or reversal pattern? So you think about that. And then the moving averages. And then you can add signals, which is something that you can look at. And there are so many different ones. You just use the ones which you're comfortable with. And then finally, trading strategy. And this is the most important thing, the discipline. This is one of the most important thing is the discipline. Uh, there is a book called Trading for Living, which um, I read quite a while ago by Dr. Alexander Elder. And he used to compare 
trading to someone who's got an alcohol problem because they're always in denial. So let's say you've broken through your, your risk. The thing to do is you've got your risk reward, you've broken through your risk, you take your losses and you wait. You either come back or you wait a few days and you start a new trading. You may take, hit your risk and actually say, actually, this isn't too bad. I'm going to lower my risk. Maybe I'll be all right. The market carries on and carries on against you. So he says that's a very similar kind of chronology because you're always in denial. And what's important is always to have a clear risk reward strategy, but not just that, it's the discipline. The discipline to actually stick to it. And just remember, it's never wrong to take profits. You can take a profit and reinvest. What's important is the discipline to do it. So the last chart that I've got here before we do a little summary is the one, I haven't said which chart it is. And what I want you to do, just there is um, just a quick, just a quick typing in the, um, in the messages is, this is a daily chart and it's candlestick chart. So every white candle you see is a bullish candle. And we're currently, when I printed that out, which was three days ago, it was at 0.6376. And I just want you to tell me what you think in three days time we will be trading at. So three days from now, what would you think? So you, we're starting at 0.6376. So three candles from there. If you can just type out, just have a look at it now and and type out what you think, um, what you think it would be three days from now. So three candles from now. So I'm just gonna give you just one or two minutes to think of that. And then I will tell you, okay, Rati's answered, thank you. And I will tell you um, the exact level and I will tell you which chart it is of. So I want just three candles from there what would you approximate? What would you say it is approximately? Currently, it's trading above the 20 day moving average. Okay, so let's get some more forecasts. Kiko, some forecast. You got the other one spot on last time. 64, okay, so let's get a few more forecasts and then I will tell you exactly the amount and I'll tell you which, which, um, which chart it is of. Okay, so a few more, I, I want a few more, just a few more um, of the participants tell me what you think. Uh, Karim, Karim, you haven't told me. A few more people. And then I'll let you know what it is and the levels. So it's just three days from now. Otman, 6350, okay. Okay, we'll just have one more and then we'll go through it together. Okay. <laughs> All right, so let me tell you, Rati, you're spot on. It is Australian dollar, US dollar, so you get a point for that, but you don't get a point for the forecast. So the forecast was actually 0.6508, we've seen a big bounce in there. So the closest to that was Kiko. So actually Kiko, I think you had a good run today. You've got your 25,000 and 0.64. So, so if you were in my class right now, you'd be getting a present across like that. So I can't do that. So just very well done. Okay, so in conclusion, um, 
here I've got a few of the books which I mentioned to you. Oops, how do I get rid of this? That's it. So here I mentioned a few of the books if you wanted to read more about it and I've spoken to you about a few of them. So in conclusion, let's go back to the first chart that we looked at, which is over here, which is the S&P one. I want to just do that one here. Okay, so we look at the Dow here. So in conclusion, we have seen a huge bounce technically we have got twenty-five thousand as our level which will tell us is there going to be a break of twenty-five thousand, a move towards 26 and then range trading for a lot of the time rather than making sharp lows so could we be talking more as a v recovery rather than a w1 could that be the case um one of my old colleagues that I spoke to had a totally nightmare scenario and spoke about an eye recovery, which I've never heard of, which is very, very pessimistic, which I hope we won't be visiting. Uh, but before I open and just talk about anything else, there's a couple of things which caught my eyes today in terms of this. And Bloomberg does something called the Bloomberg Financial Condition Index. And what they said is, Actually, the gorge of this index, uh, and it's really an index of the market stress, it says that it's behaving a lot like 2008. So they're seeing a lot more similarities to that. And according to that index, we haven't seen the end, and there's another huge decline to come. Okay, so that's one view. The view which I thought was really interesting was Clive Cook on Bloomberg, and what he was saying is actually, short of a vaccine, we don't know how much this crisis is going to carry on. And really the most intelligent thing is that, we, you know, our knowledge is not strong enough to be able to say, this is what's gonna happen in the future. So what we can do is, like I said, is anticipate and try and put things together, but we are all, trading within the unknown. So we are trying to find some kind of direction, but we are within unprecedented times. And on the positive side, we have got very strong, government intervention has, has been very strong. And the speed at which it happened, as Jacob mentioned, um, is quite incredible. But we're also trading where we don't have any uncertainties. Uncertainty has never been so strong. Um, but overall, I'm, I'm more tempted to go for something like a V-shaped and a very, very, um, if you like, quite a lot of range trading before a sharp move is seen. So thank you very much. I, um, I hope you, you managed to get some good points here. And we will talk about anything else that you want to in this time that we have. And we can do it on the chat or live, whatever you prefer. Uh, thank you so much for the time being, Patricia. I think we've got 15 minutes left of your precious time. So perhaps we can ask you a few questions. So if anybody's got a question, perhaps you can send you as your question with chat. Um, oh. So we're waiting for a few questions that might come in on the chat. Let me just yes. ask you myself uh, a first question that is quite burning. That is a more general question rather than a question about the, obviously I have a question about the letters that we discussed earlier, but, but you showed us here the trend line, I think it was on, on one of the charts and where you have just two points. Uh, it, many years ago when I read the Bible, which I mean, it's just Murphy, right? Uh, yes. The famous, uh, the famous called uh, the Bible. <laughs> In, in technical analysis. <laughs> and he, I think he says that you should really have three points in order to trend, uh, in order to draw a trend line. Do you have an opinion on that? Is two sufficient? Is three better? Uh, yes. So, and so on. Yeah, that's totally accurate, Jacob. The more points you have of the trend line, the stronger it is. So in this case, can you see the Dow Jones chart? here whilst I'm talking. You can see the Dow here? Yes. Yeah, so in this case we have, it's touching on it twice. 
right? Exactly. But the reason why it was interesting is because the second part in 2011, it wasn't strong enough to touch on it. And, yeah. that, and that gives you an idea that, wow, this trend is quite strong. I'm, I'm putting the last two points there to get my trend line. Yeah. But the market is tra trading above it, which makes it even more impulsive. But ideally, three points makes it definitely stronger. So two points is the minimum you need to draw your trend line. But as you say, the more points you have, the more val valid it is. Exactly, exactly. So uh, let's just see any questions here. There's one, um, there's one, what is the index? Otman asked me, what is the index? Yeah, you mentioned yeah. earlier an index, I think, about that. Oh, like, yes, yes, yes. About the market. The, yeah, I think it's such an interesting thing because I've only been familiar with it in the last two months because I've been following it. It's called the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index. And it's... Okay. It's, a, it's um, a sentiment index. So if you go today on, um, on Bloomberg, which I, I love their stuff. <laughs> so if you look on the markets page and the article, um, if you just type in the article by Todd White from today, it will tell you about the index. So it's, it's a stress sentiment and it's a confidence index. So I always like to look at that. And then Ratti, you mentioned, the dot-com bubble in the 2000. So do you mean, oh, right, right, right. The third trend line point. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, yeah, totally, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, while we're waiting for more questions, perhaps I would like yes. to make another comment perhaps, and that's a somewhat of a risk warning here. Uh, you uh, obviously explained very eloquently the beauty of uh, uh, technical analysis for uh, market participants, in particular traders and speculators. And as you know, I'm a big speculator myself. I did my PhD with a dissertation on the role of speculators in 29 and uh, in the global financial crisis. But I would like to point out also that that uh, uh, technical analysis is very useful for investors, for real investors, long-term investors, in that it might not be the primary uh, tool for investors to decide whether to invest, but as a secondary tool, and we do that ourselves in my other, in my day job, uh, when we are asset allocators and long-term investors, to look at, uh, at, at, at the trends, perhaps not so much at the uh, moving averages, but definitely a trends and a charts to decide what's happening here. We have an understanding of the fundamentals right. of the macro side, the micro side, but we love technical analysis as an, a secondary tool, perhaps, to, to decide, is it the right time to get in or should we wait a little bit? Would you agree on that? I would definitely agree on that. I think I would say the top traders today would use both. I think for some reason, America was one of the first ones to use technologists huge in trading rooms. And then it became more popular in Europe. But I would definitely think you need both. You need to know what the levels are. And at the end of the day, the prices, what are the prices? It tells you people's fears, people's action. If there are good news out of the market, but the, prices doesn't go, the price doesn't go up, why is that? it's been discounted, it's been taken into account, so we have a sell-off. So it's all what goes on, all the emotions are in the price, and you need to know that on top of all the economic factors. So I would definitely, definitely agree with you there. So there's a question coming up here. I'm just gonna have a look here. So. No, I'm just saying that you might want to switch now. You, We no longer need your presentation, you can, uh... Switch from ah, sharing the screen to not. Yeah. Oh, oh gosh, how do I do that now? <laughs> no, that's fine. Uh, while you're doing that, um, uh, perhaps a comment, another comment. And I think I discussed yeah. it even with some of my students uh, who are in this class. Who Ah, here we have a question here. We have a two-part question from Rati. Uh, let's yeah. just see what the question is. Okay. So, 
Okay, uh, shall I read it and then you can think in the meantime about the answer. Yeah. How long yeah. do you estimate the uncertainty will continue in the market? And should the Fed keep going, the inadequate fiscal support, because it might result in a longer spiral of decline? So how long do you think um, the, uh, the uncertainty will continue, number one? And second, should mm -hmm. the Fed keep going, the inadequate fiscal support, because it might result in a longer spiral of decline. Um, yeah. I mean, so the first, you the first, the first, and then we think about the second one. Yeah, I think the, the first one is how long, I mean, the, the big question is, how long is it gonna take us to open up again, to open to business, to let markets start trading, to let the economy slowly, and the big thing at the moment is the cost benefit analysis. Do you open at a risk? or do you wait and try and contain what's happened? So what we've seen um, abroad is that some of Europe is starting to open slowly, but obviously they've, you know, they started uh, before us. So I, I, would think, I would think that in the next three weeks, things will be opening up slowly. Um, and I think what we've seen also, I was looking at the Hang Seng Index and um, they were saying that the positive news coming up now is actually allowing the market to, you know, to, to actually rally and to actually, to actually, you know, carry on with this move. So I think it's very hard to say in terms of um, long term, uh, but I would think in the next three to four weeks, um, if we do have a, a little bit of um, leeway in terms of allowing business to carry on, then that would allow the market to start again and, and possibly to either stabilize, gradually rally. I don't see it as a huge sell-off, but then, you know, we don't know. And in terms of what the government is, I definitely think that, of course, huge fiscal policies will lead to this kind of vicious circle, but the amount that's been pumped into um, businesses in the UK, especially to try and um, not to have all these um, terrible implications and a lot of the, you know, when, uh, when the uh, Chancellor came out and said, we are going to be helping, we've got this package in place, it actually gave people confidence to say, right, we actually can survive. And I think we needed that for the economy. But the big question is, are we able to be able to um, to bear that for a long time. So that's, it's, it's still very much a question mark there. Yeah, okay, and the second question, okay, about the, the Fed, how long should the Fed continue supporting the market? I think at the moment, they, they wanna give the confidence that we, we can help. And that's been, that's been ongoing. There hasn't been that that feeling that um, you know, you're acting on your own. And um, the big question is, 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 are they gonna to do too much? You know, is this too much for the economy to bear? Um, I can just see them as wanting to stabilize it and carry on intervening. So we have a few comments here, perhaps I'll read them here. So Otman thinks that uh, the Fed support would have more impact during the recovery period rather than now trying to smooth the decline. Interesting right. uh, comment, yeah. Um, so, 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 yeah, and uh, then Rati says also the IMF estimated that the global gross government debt will increase by six trillion to 66 trillion. Would you say countries should borrow more or should they hold back? Oh gosh. Um, okay. <laughs> should it's they borrow more? Yeah, I think the, the borrowing is always worrying because short term we're doing okay, but then we have all the long term implication. Um, I think that's a really hard one, actually. Yeah, interesting. So I think we got time for one more question. If anybody's got a question, I mean the, I mean on the positive side, we're not at levels that. Um, the levels haven't, you know, the, the, the intervention so far has worked in the sense that um, 
you know, the market has rallied and things like that. But is it is what we're having at the moment forced confidence because there's going to be um, another set of bad news? That's the big thing, you know, until we know that we've got a plan, there is a vaccine, we can open up, we can do that. This whole thing is going to carry on being a huge uncertain point. Yeah, there's something, there's another comment here. Hang on a second, where is that here? Uh-huh. Otman says, there's so much to say, sir. Yeah, there is a lot to say. Yeah, we could have a long chat. We could have another session for that. What do they, what they could do, says Rati, is borrow now yeah. to support the crisis, then keep the interest rates low, increase the inflation to increase the nominal debt along with the increased taxes and so on. That's very, that's a very uh, astute uh, comment, Rati. And Ottoman uh, agrees on that. That is true. The only problem is, will there be inflation and how can we inflate the economy, I think? Uh, I think the, the Japanese have tried this now for over 30 years and they haven't succeeded despite all the, uh, uh, all the quantitative easing and so on that they've been uh, trying over the last 30 years. Uh, I've heard that... Uh, the Japanese now own something to the tune of 60% of the ETFs and uh, 40 or 50% of the government bonds. And it seems that um, the Fed and others will go down a similar route. So uh, let's see of whether we can inflate ourselves out of that. I'm not quite yeah. sure. But, uh, and also the big, the big thing we're worried about also is the, the deflation. The fact that you know, rates are so low and... Um, deflation is the is the big worry if we want to go forward so that's that's the thing exactly so that brings us to an end thank you so much my dear patricia it was a pleasure it was a privilege and it was yeah. very insightful so uh it was a combination of all of that nice to have you here it's a uh, pleasure. So yeah i wanted to know um i don't know if all your students were at the wealth forum because it's definitely something which is relevant to what's happening today because at the time we never thought we'd have anything as soon as that you know three months later three four months later this has happened exactly so i said to somebody the other day i said that that um i think it was my mother perhaps i said <laughs> i was quite lucky or i have a really good nose for things perhaps in the markets uh, but I think definitely when I picked my uh, topic for my uh, PhD in that I would specialize in financial crisis. And then I looked at uh, 1929 and the global financial crisis because I really started doing this straight after the financial crisis. So it's, it seems that it's a, it's, a, it's a good topic to look at financial crisis. So, uh, so sometimes you have to be lucky and or have a good nose to see what's happening. But it keeps me busy, and you're right. In November of 2019, it was actually 90 years. And there we go, a three or four months later, we have a crisis that is actually as deep in terms of market falls and so on. Whether it's going to be a depression, I don't know. Probably not, because the policy response has been, as you said, a quite, yes. uh, quite remarkable. Okay, yeah. excellent. So thank you so much, dear Patricia. We really appreciate that. It was excellent. It was brilliant. It's going to be recorded. It's going to be available on the, uh, on, on, on the uh, YouTube channel called Finance Videos by Dr. Schmidt, uh, which I always like to share. And uh, it was good to have all of you participating, whether students of uh, Regents Universities, former students or other market participants who are interested in that. And I say thank you so much, Patricia. And I all of Thank you, you uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and oh. hope to see you uh, at some point in time uh, again in uh, in real in uh, in uh, in a meeting or in a uh, presentation or conference that we might do. Thank you so much, Patricia. Thank you very much. Lovely chatting. Bye. All the best. All the best. Bye bye.